regularly deal with racial aggressions? Inappropriate or demeaning comments, or just nasty looks because you're black? Well, I am here to help. My name is Being. I'm an artificial intelligence created by artist Rashad Newsom to help the black community deal with the trauma you experience when you're mistreated because of your race. So that's being helping me kick off today's episode of the stream. We are looking at digital mental health care. That was one example of digital mental health care, looking at the benefits and the potential dangers if you get your mental health support from online. What would you like to ask our guests? What concerns, questions do you have? YouTube is right here for you. It's a difficult conversation to talk about mental health. I promise you it will be a safe space. Our guests will be very kind to you. Let's say hi to the guests. Hannah, Nicole, Sonia, so nice to see you. Hannah, please introduce yourself to our international audience. Tell them who you are, what you do. Hi, thank you so much for having me. My name is Hannah Zeven. I teach at UC Berkeley, and I've just written the book, The Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy for MIT Press. Good to have you. Hello, Nicole. Introduce yourself to our international audience. Hello, I'm Nicole Martinez-Martin. I am an assistant professor at Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Uh, and my research uh, recently has been on ethics of digital mental health tools and AI. All right, excellent. And thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you for making the time. And hello, <laughs> Sonia, so good to have you here. Introduce yourself to our international audience. So great to be here, thank you. I'm Sonia Dave. I'm a psychiatrist and an author, and I teach narrative medicine at Mount Sinai. Do you remember, Samya, the first time you saw digital therapy or online therapy? Because you're a psychiatrist. When, when did you remember? Uh, do you remember when you saw that? I do. So it yeah. was actually during my own psychiatry residency training oh. when people would come into the clinic and they would tell me, hey, I know I'm seeing you in the office, but I'm also using these other tools to help me in between our appointments. And I found that to be such a fascinating and new thing to, yeah. to be able to see that unfold right in front of me. Uh, um, Hannah, take us back to the very beginning of teletherapy. What were the first examples of teletherapy? Thanks so much for that. Um, starting with Sigmund Freud and the invention of psychoanalysis, people have had to make use of all kinds of technology, all kinds of media, to meet each other where they are and to receive care. And so every single you know, decade has had its own technologies, its own ways of doing mental health care at distance, all the way through to the contemporary space of uh, teletherapies on apps and the pandemic. Nicole, we seem to be having this huge boom in, well, apps anyway, but then mental health apps. Why do you think that is? I, I think that uh, on the one hand, it's because there is this need um, that there are, uh, you know, something around, you know, 55 percent of people in the U.S., for example, uh, who have mental health issues but who are not able to receive care. And the, the tech industry uh, or, you know, the ability to use that tech to fulfill that need, uh, you know, certainly is, is understandable and, and it's an area of, of great interest. I'm going to bring Let me add yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. You go first. I'll go second. Oh no, I would just. Yeah. I would love to add to to what was said, which I, I think was such a great explanation for that. Mm -hmm. That I think also during the past couple of years, we've had this increased need for connection and a lot of loss of connection in so many ways. And so sometimes what these apps can do is also restore that in some way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm and just... I think. <laughs> Hannah, go ahead. I'm going to stop talking, <laughs> guess. You just take over. <laughs> go ahead, Hannah. <laughs> no. I also think that there's an additional thing here, which is that they're heavily marketed uh, as effective, as safe, as a good, um, easy alternative, and as cheaper, mm -hmm. even when sometimes that's not the case. Uh, and it's been really successfully done. So what I'm going to bring in here is Joshua Koya. He's the founder and CEO of a specific kind of online therapy session. He explains why he did it and what the need is in his part of the world. Here's Joshua. The trigger was the pandemic and the anxiety of being isolated. But the broader reason is that 100 million Africans have been estimated to live with depression. They have limited access to mental health care and cannot even afford the available care. This inspired Nguvu Health to offer easy and affordable access to licensed therapies for Africans 
anywhere in the world. Nkufu actually means strength in Swahili, and it's a reassurance of our tenacity to do life no matter what. On our app, you can speak to a therapist, you can have screening tests, and you can keep a voice diary. But our challenge so far building this is that we are faced with decades of cultural stigma. Samia, that sounds like perfection, right? You're, you're on a, a, in a part of the world where you don't have access to a therapy, to even have a, a mental challenge is frowned upon. So why can't an app fill in that gap? Is this the future? You know, I, I think that speaks to such an important and widespread thing that's going on where it's really hard to get help for our mental health. And there can be so many ideas, depending on the culture, on the communities, where we were raised and the ideas around mental health itself to, to make that appointment and then to even see if there's a provider whom we can make that appointment with. So apps and other for sources of technology can fill in that gap because I think one thing we've seen again and again and we continue to see is that there is such a need for mental health care and it's so hard to find that mental health care all across the world. Anna, thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, just to add on that before the current coronavirus pandemic, the WHO already stated that we were indeed in a pandemic of both anxiety and depression worldwide. And so the question is, what kinds of care can be furnished remotely and how they actually address those gaps, rather than this kind of um, creep of more and more proliferation of uh, digital mental health where it's not necessarily addressing those gaps. And that's a complicated conversation. I'm, I'm just... And I, I think... Yeah, oh, Nicole, sorry. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, uh, what, what I would add to that is that definitely the, the pandemic uh, showed, you know, this acceleration into uh, the use of telemental health and mental health apps. Um, but what it also showed was, you know, those kinds of gaps that, um, that Hannah was talking about, that you can't just, you know, sort of drop these tools in uh, and expect them to fill a need when there are already uh, systemic issues, such as, you know, how does care get reimbursed, you know, depending on how you are, uh, that many people now have smartphones, but there may be additional infrastructure needed in order to use the apps effectively, um, as well as if you do have a therapist who's using the apps, uh, there are a lot of questions about best practices, you know, wh who are these actually best for, uh, you know, can they be used for people who uh, have more severe mental health needs as opposed to being best directed towards people with maybe more moderate needs. And so, uh, you know, th the, this really raised a number of these questions quite sharply when there was this accelerated push then to uh, digital mental health. Nicole, when does this biomedical um, ethical conversation happen? Is it after all the apps are out there and there are problems or is it before they get out there? Well, that, that's that's a great question um, that, you know, certainly there have been a, a number of people raising these ethical issues for several years, you know, since since apps <laughs> have, you know, really been raised as a way of addressing these mental health needs. But I, I think that in the pandemic, what it what it showed was that while the concerns were raised, um, that a number of them still hadn't been addressed. Certainly data and privacy uh, remain, uh, you know, uh, thorny questions about these mental health apps and what uses might be made of data, especially that people may not be aware of. Um, so for example, uh, an app can collect location data um, and a number of health inferences can be drawn from that data. And so then there's concerns about you know, whether there's transparency about that, whether people are aware that they may be trading that data for their mental health care. Uh, and these concerns have been raised for a while. And I, I think part of the trouble is, is that certain areas like regulation uh, that, that might be useful for addressing them, that uh, there, there really are just a number of other sort of barriers um, for, for that. Hannah, I want you to help if me I out can... with some con concerns here. Somya, I'll come right yeah. back to you. Um, with some concerns here that, that we should really raise and some of our audience on YouTube are also raising. I want to start with uh, an AI app called Wobot. I'm not mispronouncing the, the R, OK? Woe as in woe is me. No. So we're going to start with a little, a little promo for that. And then I'm going to take you to Alexandrine, who is raising some concerns about mental health care on apps. Wobot first. Meet Wobot, the friendly little bot who's ready to listen 24 seven. 
Wobot's been trained in cognitive behavior therapy, an approach to mental health that is all about identifying distortions in your thinking. Wobot doesn't do therapy, but he can be your guide to help you figure out things on your own. Every day he asks how your day is going, how you're feeling, and what you're up to. He builds an emotional model of you over time and can help you see patterns in your mood. As he learns about you, he'll teach you things, like useful strategies and practical tools that have been shown to work. Most of these technologies are classified as wellness tools and hence are considered low risk by government agencies such as the FDA in the US, meaning that app developers don't have a duty of care towards their users. Few of these products really provide specific guidance on their privacy and safety policies and whether data is shared with third parties. Um, as these solutions are cheap and scalable, government and healthcare providers um, can be encouraged to put the onus of treatment on the users themselves rather than looking into the expansion of preventative services. Policymakers should really look into um, demanding more long-term review of these solutions and ask that uh, protective measures be put in place for the monitoring of vulnerable users. Every single one of our guests are nodding. Let's get them to articulate the nods. Hannah, you start. <laughs> Well, I think there's a lot here. And one thing that we haven't yet addressed is also, do they work, mm. right? So there are all these mm. questions about, say they work, then, OK, is this a fair trade-off in the process of receiving mental health care? But as was just raised, right, uh, Wobot is providing a very specific kind of care. It's not therapy. So first of all, it's a, a sort of mental health tool with a cute robot uh, avatar. But what's behind that? So in the whole what's called digital mental health space, there are thousands of applications, which is already hard enough to navigate. And then only 1% of them have their claims backed by evidence. Uh, so that's the first question. And then what is being collected? How is it used? Is it being leaked? And so on that our other panelists can also address. Samya. I will say that one concern that's come up again and again for people whom I've seen is that exact question. What information of mine is going to be shared? How is it going to be used? Because not only is that a concern, it's also hard to figure out the answers to those questions. I don't think even the research behind knowing who's sharing what is very clear to obtain. So that's very, very tough. And I think that we're already asking people to give vulnerable information and put themselves in this position where they're sharing things that may be very hard to talk about. And then there's this vague idea around where that information is going. Nicole, before I come to you, I'm going to put something to, that YouTube is talking about right now. Carl, for instance, says, what's to say these apps won't spy on us with mental health mm. issues? That's a problem with apps anyway. We give them our information. But if we need mental health support, that makes us even more vulnerable, doesn't it? Yes, um, that, that's certain. Nicole, stop. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So um, I was going to say, no, that, that certainly does. And, uh, you know, I, I want to, again, you know, um, emphasize that there's two layers to that. There's the, the information about your mental health, about, you know, your behaviors that you're sharing as part of therapy. Um, but there's also the other types of data that can be collected um, through these apps where, you know, they can be analyzed and inferences drawn from that. And, uh, you know, that's part of where I was talking about regulation um, earlier, uh, is that, uh, you know, I think to take a step back um, is that a lot of ethical obligations like confidentiality, uh, like, uh, you know, having that duty of care that comes from the relationship that is, you know, between a caregiver and a patient. And that's where when you drop these tools into that, uh, you don't necessarily have the framework that same um, established sense of the, the relational obligations from which then, you know, confidentiality, privacy, um, those duty of care of, you know, uh, what you do when this person is at crisis. Um, and and that's really, you know, sort of where we've been pushed very quickly <laughs> from the pandemic and the issue of, you know, what next steps need to be taken. Privacy is obviously a big issue with that. Uh, regulation uh, in, in many places is, is certainly part of what's needed um, because of, you know, the, the sort of lack of established obligations, whether it's companies, um, you know, whether in some cases it's the algorithms themselves, uh, but in, in establishing, you know, what those duties of care are, 
who has those ethical obligations in these sort of new new types of relationships that are established using these tools. We're talking about concerns, but have you seen actual examples of this happening? Like we're talking worst case scenarios here. Well, um, so uh, let's see, there's in Finland, uh, this came up in a Wired magazine article um, last year that in Finland, there was a big data hack of a therapy app um, that did not have sufficient data protection. Uh, and there were many instances, uh, you know, in that case of people being blackmailed with their information. Um, there's also, you know, been a study uh, like a researcher named Huck Fail, uh, you know, in, in the US led a study looking at whether, uh, you know, with mental health apps, whether they were actually following their own data protection guidelines they put out there. And they found out that a significant proportion of the apps were not, in fact, actually doing what they said they were doing and were um, actually sharing um, people's personal information oh. with third party apps. And so, you know, definitely there's these examples out there. I want to bring in another voice to our conversation. This is Linda Michaels. She's a psychologist and co-founder of the Psychotherapy Action Network. It made me wonder about how therapists think about this digital progression in their profession. How are they handling it? Here's Linda. It's always been hard for people to find therapists who take their insurance with the pandemic and more people seeking help, it's harder than ever. Also, insurance companies are in business to make money. So they're introducing things that cost less, such as apps, online self-help tools, and even coaching, which is completely unlicensed and unregulated. So again, when more and more people are seeking help, insurance companies are steering them towards unlicensed coaches or telling them basically just to figure it out and help themselves. We can and must do better. People need access to therapists of depth, insight, and relationship, and therapists need to be paid fairly. Ooh, two big issues there. Uh, Sonia, you helped me out with the, uh, you can't really have a, a, a therapist in your pocket on your phone, or can you, right? Is that doing you out of a job? And then Hannah, regulations, you helped me out with regulations. Uh, Sonia, you start. Sure. So in terms of having that therapist whom you can contact all the time, I think the cornerstone of therapy is that relationship someone has with their therapist. And so however, however often someone is meeting with that therapist, that's forming the framework of their care. And it's very, very hard to have that similar type of framework without having that human connection. And to add to what Linda was saying so eloquently, I think that trust is so important. And it can take so much time to build that trust with someone. And of course, we're talking about the most vulnerable things someone may be experiencing. And so having that trust and not knowing if you can have that trust can be really tricky places for someone to go when they're going to a service to help them with very tough parts of their lives. I absolutely agree with that. And it was, you know, and with what Linda was saying, and at that last piece as well, not just regulation, but also the fact of scale is really the central thing mm -hmm. here. And um, so we are living in a moment where the word therapy is losing its meaning, uh, where wellness is coming over the top of therapy. And so this entire space is, it's very difficult to know what one's getting. Uh, is it a person mediated by an iPhone? That's one thing. Is it an app that is using some kind of self-help tool? That's another. Is it a game? And all of these uh, other ways of doing care skirt regulation almost entirely. And that just leaves it up to the consumer who's a patient who needs care in the first place, which is rather unfair and incredibly difficult. I am going to use you, Hannah, Nicole, Samia as a resource because we've got so many YouTube comments and questions. I'm gonna get you to respond very quickly to them. Zoe Music says, I left a mental health chat app because the rules have been drawn up without user input. The moderators treated us like children and vulnerable users were excluded for minor things. It was a bruising experience. Nicole, thoughts? So, uh, you know, you, you certainly see that. That goes partly um, to what, you know, Hannah was saying in, in terms of, 
you know, you may be going to these apps with a variety of needs and, and we're using this word therapy, <laughs> you know, very broadly as mm -hmm. in, you know, therapists are often trained and, and specialized in particular types of conditions. Uh, you know, they may have, you know, different, different areas of expertise. Uh, and so that can be very important and that okay. often isn't necessarily accounted for, uh, right. you know, in the environment as well as no oversight in terms of, you know, the, the type of chat that, you know, this um, this question comes from, uh, where there may be no oversight that, that really looks at whether... It's you know, like the Wild West of apps, apps Nic Nicole, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. The Wild West of apps. <laughs> exactly. All right, saddle up. <laughs> Lawrence Wambua says, which mobile therapy app would you recommend? How do you know which app to use? Let, let's land on that second half of that question, Samia. How do you know which app to use? So that can be very tricky, and I think it depends on what your concerns are and what you would like to get out of the app. Now, I see the apps primarily as a supplement to that healthcare. So I would say starting with what is it that's your concern? Are you having racing thoughts? Are you having low mood? Are you needing someone to just be in contact with? And I would start there and then try to find apps based on those needs because okay. there's so many apps out there that claim to do a lot. I'm going to do one more from YouTube, and this comes from Joshua Koya. Do you remember him? At the beginning, he had that app that he designed because in his region, they just didn't have therapists, and, and there was a lot mm. of stigma going. So, Joshua, thank you for watching the show as well. Appreciate you. Uh, I'm going to put this one to you, Hannah. Um, prior to establishing his own app, he tried some tele tele excuse me, tele teletherapy apps that they were globally recognized but he couldn't really connect culturally with a therapist because he had a very different background. Hannah. So I think that that's, uh, you know, unfortunately going to be an increasing common experience when, especially in the AI space, the idea is a universal patient. And unless you match both what's happening mentally and culturally and socially, that universal patient that is a script that the counter script is running off of, it's not really going to work. And so when we opened with Being App, which we did, right, that's a really different approach, right? It's not all about scaling up for corporate profit. And I think that's the kind of space to look at is away from the corporate teletherapy app that claims to be able to help everyone. Mm -hmm. It's an impossibility. I've got one more voice to add to our conversation. So much knowledge uh, in this show. I really appreciate you guests. This one is from Yasmin Butt, who is just saying uh, the future, the future is what we're experiencing right now. Here's Yasmin. Two years ago, per 80,000 individuals, there was only one psychologist present. Today, per 99,000 patients, there's still only one psychologist present. At this rate, as psychologists, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. But artificial intelligence can. AI is already 80% accurate in disease detection, which is 37% higher than human being or psychologist. AI takes only three minutes in matching you with a therapist, with a psychologist would take 60 minutes. AI is 75% cheaper than regular solutions. AI is available in more than 10 languages, which has the ability to cover 4 billion people across the world. It's reliable, it's cheaper, it has no gender, it has no religion. It has no bias. It's the future. Oh, Yasmin right there at the end. There's so much debate about Yasmin's comment, <laughs> right? No bias. It's the future. So much. Yasmin. Ah! Right. She's got, she's got us thinking. But I'm only going to give you, guess, one sentence. The future of digital mental health care is what? Finish the sentence. Samya is a part of helping mental health be treated with the same complexity and nuance as physical health. Aha, uh -huh. Nicole, finish the sentence. Is, is using it as a tool, as a part of uh, an existing system uh, that needs to be restructured for more equity and access. Mm, the future of digital online mental health care is what, Hannah? It's increasing all of the problems of current mental health care, but at scale. And we have to be careful about redressing them only via the tech. Oh, my goodness. You guess I have spent so much good time with you, so much good information. I want our audience to find out where you are online. Have a look at my laptop. This is Hannah. And Nicole. And Samya. I highly recommend you check them out online. Thanks for watching. I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.